excuse children for children's church. Good morning again. A long time no see. Yeah. While the kids are going out, I'd like you to join with me in a word of prayer, please. Father, we do thank you for this day. Um, we thank you that you are our Father and the ultimate pattern of what it means to be a father. We cry out to you, Abba, Father, in the most intimate way that we can. Your spirit cries out within us to praise you for our relationship to you because we know that we could not exist apart from you. And so I pray that you would help us to um, understand fatherhood this morning, but also understand what it means to be good children. Help us, Father, to understand also that in this room there are those who do not have fathers, for they have passed away, and um, this could be a particularly difficult day for them. We pray your blessings and your comfort for them. Now, Lord, we ask that you would attend us in your scripture to understand it and to read it and to be taught by it. And so we uh, give ourselves to that task now, and we do so in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. We're going to, um, back to the Psalms this summer, we um, last summer did a summer series called The Lord of the Song. And uh, so we're going to, for the rest of the summer, be looking at some of the Psalms in Scripture. And uh, this morning's Psalm is Psalm 127. And so here at Valley Bible Church, we believe that uh, God's Word is the most important thing and that when we read it, He speaks. And so therefore, we must give attention to the public reading of Scripture. And I ask you to stand as we read Psalm 127. If, you're ha if you have a Bible, open it up, I ask you please. If you have a digital version, that's fine as well. But would you please give attention to the reading of God's Word, Psalm 127, the Word of God. A Song of Ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Would you please be seated? So for a Father's Day message, um, we are going to teach from the Scriptures. Um, is Father's Day a time to teach fathers, or is it a time to teach children about fathers? Trick question, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a time for both. And I think this psalm does that well. Um, it teaches us about fathers, encourages fathers, but it also teaches children about fathers. And, um, but before we get to the psalm, just a quick refresher on the psalms. Last year we began a summer series called The Lord of the Song. And uh, we did an extensive background of the psalms at that time. I'm not going to do that this morning. Um, um, there's a lot to... Uh, the Psalms, I will tell this kind of this story just a little bit again. Um, when I first became a Christian, I did not like the Psalms, and people would read the Psalms and talk about how wonderful they were, and uh, I thought Psalms were for sissies, because they're poetry, and I, you know, I, I just came to Christ, I was a hard-drinking beer brawling kind of guy <laughs> and uh, poetry really God uh, I hated poetry in college and I endured it but I just did not like poetry and so I didn't really give much attention to the Psalms 
until my fourth year in seminary. And my fourth year in seminary, the la actually I took a, an elective beyond it, but the, the last major psalm, or rather Hebrew course that I took was on the psalms. And it was the hardest class that I had ever taken in my entire life. Because I learned that the psalms were very deep and rich, and um, I had to go deep in grammar and syntax and uh, lexical studies and theology, and I, uh, I, be, I came to understand and appreciate the depths of the psalms. They are at once easy to read and understand and most difficult. And the meanings are oftentimes very, very deep, but yet anyone can read them and get something out of them, for it is God's word and the Spirit works through it and teaches us through the Psalms. Um, so they're very, very deep, and I love the Psalms now. I, I love the, the poetry. I love the, the difficulty of, and the challenge of getting into the grammar and the uh, structure and all the wonderful things that are there. So Psalms are wisdom literature. Wisdom literature are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, that's what we call, in Lamentations, I believe, uh, we call uh, wisdom literature. Wisdom in the Old Testament is, is teaching how to live life very practically. And that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is not some esoteric knowledge that you go to a guy up on a mountain to ask about. No, wisdom is something to be shared and lived. And it is very pa practical. It is sometimes called skill in living. That's what the Hebrew word for wisdom means. How to live practically, and, and wisdom literature is full of poetry and songs, and it is uh, full of short, pithy sayings, like uh, the Proverbs have these short little sayings, and they just, they kind of stick with you, and that's, they're, they're wise. They say something about life and how you live life. So Psalms are wisdom literature. Psalms are also songs. Psalms were meant to be sung. They were meant to be sung in worship. And uh, they had a tune. We don't know what they were. Wouldn't it be fascinating to have a recording or some musical notation? But we don't know what uh, they sounded like. And that's always been very myst mysterious to me as a musician. But uh, just the very fact that part of their genre is music uh, lends some air of importance to them as well. Because we sing on Sunday mornings. And it's a, a huge part of what we do, singing to the Lord. And so psalms are songs. Psalms are also lyric poetry. And poetry, as I said before, is not always easy to understand. Poetry takes some, hmm, some time to digest and think about. And in the psalms, the lyric poetry of psalms, uh, if you remember, perhaps not, but uh, two things you need to remember is that you need to understand parallelisms that the psalms don't rhyme words like roses are red, violets are blue. It rhymes thoughts. And some of those thoughts are parallel to one another. Some of those thoughts are antithetical to one another. Sometimes one thought will complete the first thought. And so they rhyme thoughts, parallelisms, rather than rhyming words. Second thing to remember about lyric poetry is it is full of figures of speech. And if you remember your high school or college literature classes where you learned uh, about metaphor and simile and all those wonderful words, there's, there are so many types of, of uh, figures of speech that I had no idea even existed. And so they're cataloged in various forms and psalms are full of figures of speech. Now the psalms are categorized by scholars into various categories. There are individual laments where, like David would say, Lord, why have you forsaken me? And, and someone would cry out to God. And, and we talked about that last week, uh, talking about difficulties in our lives sometimes where sometimes people say they need to forgive God and that's a category mistake. No, they need to understand what God is doing. And sometimes we can't understand what God is doing. But it is appropriate and okay to say, God, what are you doing? I don't understand it. Give me a break here. And the Psalms are full of clear language like that where an individual will lament before God and just, I'm going to lay it out, God. I don't get it. What are you doing here? And that is an individual lament, and we see those oftentimes in the Psalms. Then there are national laments where the nation says, God, why have you forsaken us? Because 
And the answer is always because, well, you forsake me. And God was always fighting with Israel over their fidelity to him. And so uh, national laments are those psalms that are asking that question. Then there are declarative praise psalms, sometimes called thanksgiving psalms. These are individual praise psalms where one person would praise the Lord. And then there are descriptive praise psalms, sometimes called hymns, that are corporate praises to the Lord. There are royal psalms that uh, speak of the oftentimes enthronement of the king of Israel and uh, often have a secondary meaning in that they are messianic in nature, speaking of the forthcoming, forthcoming uh, Messiah, the king of kings. Then there are wisdom psalms. Some, even though this is wisdom literature, some of the psalms are categorized as wisdom psalms because they're very practical in nature. And then there are pilgrim psalms, which are Psalms 120 to 134 that were meant to be sung um, as people went up to Jerusalem for the festivals. So let's look at our psalm and see where it falls into place. Psalm 127, the superscription, which is part of the Hebrew, says this, a song of ascents of Solomon. Now, that's very important to understand. It's not just something that someone wrote up there. This is part of the scripture. It is a song of ascents. It is a pilgrim psalm. Song, uh, songs of ascents, as I just said a minute ago, or pilgrim psalms, were Psalms 120 through 134. And these were the songs that uh, Israelites would sing three times a year. They would go up to Jerusalem for festivals. And while they're walking along the road, they had this set of songs. They're holiday songs. And they knew the tunes, they knew the words, and they would, we're going up to Jerusalem, and we always sing these songs when we're going. It's, they're, they're, so they're family songs, they create memories. Remember the time we were going up for Passover, and we sang that song, and along the way we met this guy. It, it's like Christmas songs. You know, when, you, when the, the season comes, and you hear the first Christmas songs that are sung, it, it immediately uh, instills or, or and awakens in you some nostalgia of Memories of days gone by, holidays gone by, sometimes pleasant, sometimes not, but usually it's a, it's a warm feeling of Christmas. And these songs would have been that type of songs because they were sung by families as they were walking up to Jerusalem. Going up, the ascent means going up to Jerusalem. Sometimes you can go south and that would be down, but Jerusalem was always up because it was a city on a hill. So that, the direction is always up. So as these families walked along the way, they had these, this set of holiday songs that they would sing. And so they instantly knew the words. They instantly knew the metal, melodies. It's like singing, O come all ye faithful. We, we know the words. We know the melody. We don't have to be taught it. And so that's what the songs of ascent were all about. Then it says here, a song of ascent of Solomon. Now most people think that David wrote the psalms but he wrote many of them, but Solomon wrote many as well. Solomon, of course, wrote many of the Proverbs and Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes and many of the Psalms. And so <clears throat> this is a Song of Solomon, and it is classified as, it has kind of a double classification. It is a pilgrim song, a song of ascent, but it is also a wisdom psalm because it is very practical. And you'll see that as we get along. Now, Solomon wrote a lot of wisdom literature. After all, he was supposedly uh, the wisest man who ever lived to a point, right? <laughs> Which his life is always a cautionary tale to us in that he prayed for wisdom and God gave him this great wisdom to live and yet he didn't follow it himself. Later in life, it says that he married many foreign wives and they led his heart astray. And so why was it wrong to marry those wives? Number one, he was already married, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's the, the, the pattern in the scripture, by the way. Um, I just did a wedding yesterday and, and God's pattern for marriage is one man, one woman for life. And so... For some reason unknown, perhaps we'll understand in eternity, God will explain to us, why did you tolerate all those, those marriages? Why did, you know, in a sense he didn't. Because there was some uh, 
withholding of blessings because uh, they did not follow that. But anyway, the first reason is he was already married. That's why he shouldn't have married those women. The second reason that he shouldn't have married those women is because they did not believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They weren't saved. They weren't believers. In fact, they were worshipers of foreign gods. And they led his heart astray from the one true God. In the New Testament, we see very, in, a, in a very succinct statement in 2 Corinthians that kind of summarizes much of the Old Testament, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And that's not just about marriage, but it includes marriage. But the application for you, young people, is you should marry a believer if you are a believer. And if you are unequally yoked with someone who is not a believer, they might lead your heart astray. And that is wisdom. Unfortunately, the Sol Solomon did not follow. So, let's get on with the psalm. There are two strophes, or two stanzas, if you will, uh, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 3 and 5. And the, the first two verses are a call to fathers to live in dependence upon God. And then the second uh, strophe, verses 3 through 5, is basically a call for children to have their fathers back. Be there for dad. So this psalm is about faith. It's about including God in all aspects of domestic life, living life that is dedicated to the Lord. There are ensuing blessings when we do that. God blesses us when we include Him in everything that we do, which we are supposed to do. But our efforts in everything that we do in life are of no value unless we include the Lord in those efforts. So this is a call to fathers to live lives dependent on God. And we're going to break this down. Uh, there's a lot, actually, in these first two verses. And the first thing is that our projects have no value if God is not our source of power. Our projects, whatever they are in life, they don't have any value if God is not our source of power. He says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. That's the, the, the language of Solomon from the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity. You'll see the word vain repeated in the first part of verse, uh, in verse 1 twice, and then in verse 2, in empty, futile. Our projects in life, whatever they may be, they're empty unless God is part of them. Now, he, he says, unless the Lord, uh, the Lord builds a house, obviously, the first thing you would think of with Solomon is the house of the Lord, right? He built the temple. He was the one who built the temple. But it, he doesn't necessarily have that in mind for us because everyone builds a house to some extent. And this is, uh, these are principles that are general for all people, for all men. If you're building your house, if you have a project, include God in it. He needs to be part of that. He needs to be part of your life. And when he is not part of your life and not part of that project, you're on your own. You're just doing it yourself. And he's not the one who's building. Uh, yes, this is a, an oft-quoted uh, verse, rather, for uh, building projects for church. Um, unless the Lord builds the house, you know, we will use that as a, as a rallying cry for building a new building. But what is the house of God in the New Testament? It's y'all. It's us. God is building this house, these people, not a project, not a building. And the most important thing he builds is us and the family of God. And so our projects in life are of little effect unless God is part of it. He has to be in it. Uh, our efforts yield nothing if God is not in it and God is not supporting it. And that's just a general lesson about life that include God in your plans. And when you don't include Him in your plans, you're on your own. Second thing from verse 1 is that our protection is futile if God is not our protector with a capital P. Verse 1, second part of verse 1 says, unless the Lord guards the city... The watchman keeps awake in vain. Now, obviously, first thought of the city for us, Solomon writing, would be Jerusalem where the temple was built. But still, this is a general principle that if you have a walled city and you've got guards up there protecting, and you need to have guards up there, yes, 
But if they do not include the Lord, if, they're not, if their trust is not in the Lord, then that, it, there's no power in protection. You can get, have all the guys up there you want, but if God is not in it, you're going to be overrun. That we, uh, Israel saw that many times. They saw sometimes they would go to battle with a few guys and beat a lot of guys up. Sometimes they would go to battle with a lot of guys and they would get beat up by a few because they weren't trusting in God. And so that we see that principle in battle. We live in a world of, where protection is pretty important, isn't it? Security cameras, security systems. We have security here at church. Um, you probably, many have um, security in the form of uh, handguns or weapons at home. Security is really important. But where does your trust lie? Is it in your security system? Is it in your handgun locked away? Is it in your cameras? Or is your trust and your hope and protection in the Lord? When I was in Iraq, or rather before we went into Iraq, to Iraq in Kuwait, um, had a, an opportunity to, to, to meet and talk with lots of Marines, young men who love to do uh, pull-ups. The first thing that uh, Marines will do when they set up a garrison camp is the pull-up bar because that just, you know, you've got to have the muscles and you've got to work out, and it's a big deal for Marines. And um, they like to be bad. I think all sol soldiers are that way. I'm tough, I'm strong, I'm muscular, I'm lean, I'm a fighting machine, I'm a marksman. And I would tell these guys, no muscles can stop a round from an AK-47. So yes, you need to be well-trained. Yes, you need to work out and do your pull-ups. But ultimately, you need to use your head. And you need to be wise because bravado can get you in trouble. And if you do not trust in the Lord, you might lose your life. Or if you do lose your life, what then? Unless your trust is in the Lord. Same for us, right? Where does your protection lie? What are you teaching your children, fathers? Are you teaching your children to trust in their own resources for protection or in trust in you? Yes, to some extent, you should be their protector. I got thinking about a prayer that um, I was taught and said when I was a little boy. It's actually an 18th century prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake... I pray the Lord my soul to take. It's a good prayer, actually. It's a good prayer to teach your children that their ultimate protection is not you and not their life, but their ultimate protection is in the Lord. Whether it's that prayer or another prayer, fathers, teach your children that protection, with a capital P, is the Lord. And um, not a handgun, not a security system, not anything of that nature, but ultimately our protection is in Him. The third thing that we see is in verse 2 that our profession, whatever it may be, is unfulfilling if God is not our provider. Whatever it is you do for a living, call it a profession. It, it, it doesn't count for anything. He says it is vain. He uses the word for the very third for the third time. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. It's empty. It's useless to work hard. When he says rise up early and go to bed late, he's talking about uh, an artificial extension of the workday. Your workday may be nine to five, but you're going to get the early word get, gets early bird gets the worm, right? So you're going to start two hours early and you're going to work two hours late or more. But he's saying if, if you think that that's where your provision lies in extending your work day, it's vanity. It's empty and useless. I mean, this is kind of work, workaholism, isn't it? The man who just cannot stay away and so to rise up early and to retire late is to eat the bread of painful labors. 
Now, there's a difference between eating the bread of painful labors and eating the bread of joyful labors. Because painful labors, I mean, it's the word sorrow it, and, or anxiety, that you're always anxious, you always got to get ahead, you always got to work more, you're always worried about the future. Where's God in that? He's not talking about not working hard. He just, he, the, 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 the issue is, have you included God in your labors, in your hard work? There is a time to rise early, right? There is a time to work late. I, got, I get that. I do it. You do it. But if God is not in it, it's vain. Then the food that you eat, you don't enjoy it. It's the bread of anxiety. It's the bread of painful labors rather than the bread of joyful labors. God wants us to enjoy what we get, what we earn. One of the things that we wanted to do in this, this summer in the Psalms is to kind of hearken back to the book of Ephesians and find some of the themes that we have already talked about and how we see that they're repeated throughout scriptures. And, and so Ephesians 4, 28, it wasn't that long ago, just a few weeks ago that we looked at this verse. Those who have laid aside the old self and they put on the new self, he says, he who steals must steal no longer. Somebody was stealing in the church. But rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. This is the proper way to do it. The opposite of rising early and staying late is laziness, right? The sluggard, that's the opposite. But you can go to two extremes. You can either be a sluggard or you can steal. Or you can go to the other extreme where you just work hard and you, you, you work your tail off, but God's not in it. But here we see in Ephesians 4 that there is purpose in your work. You work hard, and it's satisfactory, and it's satisfying, and it is fulfilling because there's purpose in it. You want to share what God gives to you and brings to you. And so work, he doesn't say don't work. He just says when you work, don't work in vain. Include God in your plans and include God in whatever it is you do, whether it's a business or you work for the man, or you work for yourself, whatever it may be, don't let it be vain and, in, and useless. Two quotes that uh, bear repeating here, I think, um, and they're said in various ways. One is, uh, no one ever said on their deathbed, I wished I had spent more time at the office. No one ever says that, right? Another one is this, some get to the top of the ladder of success only to find it was leaning against the wrong wall. And we can do that. I mean, we, we lose sight. How, how, is, how does that happen? Because your life isn't framed according to God. Your, your, your life is not including God. You're, you're, you're focused on work rather than serving God. And so we want to fix that by making sure our priorities are straight, right? Let's, let's, let's list your priorities and let's, let's uh, um, prioritize your schedule or schedule your priorities, different ways you've heard about it in management uh, books. But let's, you know, you list your, your priorities, okay, God, ch family, church, business, whatever it may be, golf, fishing. And so we make a list. But I've always said that God is not on your list. He is the list. God is the list. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. He's, just, he's the list. You just do that. If you do that properly, then you are in, including him in the building. You're including him in, in the guarding and protecting. You're in, including him in, in the providing. And I know that every man in here, every father, struggles with the question, am I spending enough time at work or am I spending enough time at home? Right? I mean, we all struggle with it. 
how do I do both of those properly, God? And it's a, it's a lifelong struggle, believe me. You'll always. And some of us do better than others. And some of us fail from time to time. All of us fail from time to time, one or the other. But we always must ask the question. The, the, the real key in this, I think, is not, again, well, I'm going to make a list of my priorities. It's just making God your priority. And when he's your priority, it's all going to fall into place. So, um, men, you are in good company. This is not meant to make us feel guilty. This is meant to make us men of God and make us better men of God and focus on Christ better. The last thing we see in the first strophe is that our life of faith brings ultimate satisfaction. It's not our building, it's not our protection, it's not our work. It's a life of faith. Because the last part of verse 2 says, For he gives to his, his beloved even in his sleep. Literally, actually, it's, it says, For he gives to his beloved in sleep. It could mean two things. First of all, let me just say this. The, his beloved obviously means, he's been talking about vanity, it's useless to do all these things. So the, other, the flip side of it is, is that God is in it. God is the one who's here. And the one who is beloved is the one who has included God in his plans. The man or the father who has placed God as the ultimate priority in his life, that he is the list. And as we seek him and, and his righteousness and his kingdom and we follow hard after him and we discipline ourselves to the purpose of godliness and we are in a right relationship with him because we are in a covenant relationship with him, we are his beloved. And he gives to his beloved those who are faithful even in his sleep. Two things about the sleep part. It could mean he gives sleep. He gives to his beloved sleep. Uh, meaning here not vanity and not painful labors and eating the bread of, uh, of painful labors, but uh, a, a sleep that is satisfying and fulfilling and restful because your heart and your conscience is right before God, but also the truth that God multiplies and blesses our work and you can't outwork God and you, if you do the best you can, because all you can do is all you can do, and you give it to God, and you say, Lord, you bless it, because I, I, I got to cut off for the day. I need to be home. Work we must, but the increase is His. It belongs to Him. So those first two verses have a lot in them. The first strophe, the first stanza, verses 1 and 2. And then verses 3 and 5 talk about children. Whereas the first strophe was about a father, a man, giving himself to the Lord, verses 3 through 5, we see a call to children to be a blessing to their fathers. For children to be a blessing to their fathers. Children are a blessing and a trust. Amen? Amen. Verse 3 says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Children are fantastic. Those of you who have them know. <laughs> they're fantastic. They're wonderful. Too often in our present culture, um, people speak of parenthood and children and, and, and joke about it and... and um, um, speak of parenthood and kids with some amount of disdain, right? Don't you see that in TV sitcoms and everywhere? It's just jokes about dads and kids. And um, If you are currently watching um, Hulu or any kind of online TV or just TV at all, you've probably seen over and over and over again the direct TV ad with Bon Jovi, right, about... Uh, uh, we give you the power to turn back time, and there's this, this with the, the new uh, um, direct TV receiver, you can start any, any show at any time, and you can turn back time, and Bon Jovi is singing, you can turn back time, and, and maybe reconsider having that second child. 
turn back time, and these parents look at each other kind of knowingly and look at each other. It's supposed to be funny. Maybe we should, if we could turn back time, maybe we wouldn't have that kid. That's the way our world looks at kids sometimes. Sad. But children are a reward to those who work with God's presence and acknowledgement as something that God gives as a, the supreme example of how God blesses the man who, who includes God as part of his life and, and, and is a, a man who lives in dependence upon him. The word gift is also, uh, the word actually means heritage. And um, a heritage from the Lord, the operative term is of the Lord. It comes from God. A, ch- a child is your heritage from him. And a heritage is something to be passed along, right? And so your heritage, dads, is not the house that you're going to pass on. It's not the collection of guns for protection that you're going to pass on. It's not the business that you built up or the money you saved that you're going to pass on as a heritage to your children. The heritage you want to pass on is godliness. That's the heritage. Because they are a heritage to you and then their children are, are a heritage that God gives to them. And that is to be passed on. It is of the Lord. Children are a gift and the fruit of the womb. It's a blessing. They're a blessing spoken of here. Second, verse 4, we see children bring untold benefits to their fathers. Verse 4, he says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. So here we see figure of speech, a simile. They are uh, like arrows... In the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Funny illustration. Funny metaphor. A warrior, the word is the word, Hebrew word gibor. In gibarim last year when we did our, our men's retreat, we talked about the gibarim, the mighty men of God, David's mighty men, and they were listed in, in the Bible. And these gibarim, some of these men did these incredible feats of warfare that were superhuman. Why did they do those things? How could they do those things? Because the Lord was in it. Because God, how can one man kill hundreds of of enemy soldiers by himself in hand-to-hand combat? God has to be in it, right? And so this Gibor, we all men want to be warriors. And when you go into battle... For them, you have to have a full quiver. Your, 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 your clip is full, in other words. you got all these arrows because to get into battle without a, a, a weapon, that's a sad state of affairs. And so children are to a father who is a warrior, arrows in the hand of a warrior. And children to the Israelites were the, the greatest blessing of all. They, the, the Jews saw uh, children as the greatest enrichment that God would bring to a marriage. Infant mortality was high, and so they had as many kids as the Lord would give them because they never knew uh, when a child might die. And it was significant for them to, to receive a child, and they held them in high esteem. And so to be empty-handed in a battle would be a horrible state of affairs. And for a man not to have his children would be difficult as well. We also see, well, let me just say this, children bring untold benefits to their fathers. Um, you don't really realize this till you have your own kids, right? How much you appreciate your dad how much you appreciate his sacrifice, things that he taught you, the things that he said. My dad was not a believer until right before he died, but I still sought his wisdom. And when uh, I remember uh, Tara and I going to him before we uh, went into the Navy active duty, and I I sought his advice, even though he was not a believer, but uh, it was my dad, and I wanted to honor him. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, it's a dangerous job. I hadn't considered that. (laughs) I hadn't even thought of it because I'm going to be a chaplain. How hard can that be? How dangerous can it be? He was right. Dangerous job. So all of our dads have wisdom that we should glean and and learn from. And 
And uh, so then children, we, we tell our kids, you don't understand how much I love you. You just can't understand it until you have your own kids, and then you understand. Right, Jonathan? <laughs> and you understand. We also see in verse 5 that children bring security to their fathers, and this is the part about having your dad's back. Verse 5 says, How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of arrows, of children. He's got a bunch of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Hmm, what on earth could that mean? Why would he not be ashamed when he speaks with his enemies at the gate? Remember, he said, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of children of his youth. So this assumes that he has grown a little bit. This man has, and his children are older as well. At the gate is the place in Israel. The gate of the city would be the place where men would do business, where they would settle legal disputes and financial disputes. And so he speaks here of enemies of your father, and they are perhaps speaking lies or trying to take advantage of your dad, and, and he shows up at the gate, and who co- shows up with him? I got my kids with me. I got my boys. By the way, the word arrows is also a word for words, arguments, and maybe perhaps a double meaning here that the, the sons show up here and, and they're They're quick to argue and quick to make a case for their dad. They have their dad's back. And so he's not ashamed. He's not going to be put down. He's not going to lose the legal battle, the financial battle, the business battle with his enemies because his kids have his back. So kids, you need to have your father's back. God has prospered him and surrounded him with children. He's got a full quiver, and he's got courage and strength and confidence to move forward in life because he knows he has his children behind him. And dads, you know what that's like, right? Knowing that your kids are behind you. Now, some final thoughts also from Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 4, we'll get to chapter 6 later on. It says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Men, walk with God. I often say to be the best father you can be, be the best Christian you can be, to be the best husband you can be, be the best Christian you can be. So walk with God. And that's the best thing you can do for Father's Day is to walk with God. And that's the best thing you can do to be a great father. And it's the best thing you can do for your children is to be a man of God. Now here's the thing. Some of you guys are are, are even going, oh, but I feel, feel like I may have blown it. Days and years gone by, and I didn't take the opportunity, or I didn't do it enough. You know what? Even if your children are grown, they're still your kids. And you will not stop being their father until the day you die, or the day they die before you, God forbid. They're still your sons and your daughters, and you still have an opportunity to influence their lives. Paul Murray is an incredible example of that. Men, if you want to know, what can I do for my adult kids? Talk to Paul. He has set an incredible example of having adult children and spending time with them that is quality and important and spiritual as well, continuing to teach them even though they're grown. So, men, you can still do that. For children, Ephesians 6, 1 and 2 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, one of the Ten Commandments, which is the first commandment with a promise, and the promise is this, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. If you are following God and honoring your dad, God will prosper you. This is a command that does not expire when you grow up and move out honoring your dad. No, it continues on the rest of your life. Pay back time, in a sense, in a good way. To pay back your dad with honor, with blessings, regardless of the past, regardless if he always got it right or not, you can still honor your father today and have his back. 
Finally, Proverbs 16, 7 says, Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their father. Kids, you're all kids. Your glory is your dad. Your glory is your father. Have his back and honor him today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this incredible psalm. And we ask that we might live this wisdom literature, that we might live wisely. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.